ADA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me are my fabulous co-hosts. Hi, Rob. It's Diana. And it's Jackie. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hi, Rob. Good. Excellent. Today, we are recording episode 11, where we'll be talking about preventing errors in discrete trial training. Our two articles for t- this week's episode are... Reduction of Stimulus Overselectivity with Nonverbal Differential Observing Responses by Duby and McIlvain from JABA, 1999. And Increasing the Saliency of Behavior Consequence Relations for Children with Autism Who Exhibit Persistent Errors by Fisher, Powich, Dix, Payden, and Toussaint from JABA, 2014. We all work with children who use discrete trial training in some component or another, or children, young adults, Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've all had those programs that we run and we run and we run and we wonder, why can't this student just get this skill? What's the matter with it? Why why aren't they learning? I'm reinforcing the right things. I'm extinguishing the wrong things. So I think today is is a a nice review of some ways to possibly get around these frustrating error patterns. Sounds good to me. There are so many different variables, I think, that can go into play here. When you're not getting the acquisition that you're expecting. And this covers a couple of the potential problems, but I feel like there are so many other ones that we can maybe talk about Mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start with these two manipulations. And Jackie, you are going first with the Doobie and Micklevain article on stimulus overselectivity and differential observing responses. So let's get right into it. Yeah, so it's important to note that this study is a bridge study, so it's a basic analog experiment testing out their theory, but it's not uh, applied in any way. So any of all the stimuli that they used were nonsense stimuli, but they think that it could be applied, and we're going to talk about a, Mm -hmm. a replication of the article that actually did have some clinical applications, but it's really important to note that this was more of a theoretical article Looking I like, at... I like bridge study. I like that, that too. That was a good term. I was like, aw, bridge study. Yeah. So it's looking at a socially relevant problem in more of a tightly controlled experiment. Right. Sometimes you got to take it all the way back. hmm Yeah, so here they're looking at overselectivity. This can also be termed as restricted stimulus control, and this is when a student may have atypically limited learning with respect to range, breadth, or number of the stimuli. So that's how it was described by Lovas and colleagues in 1979. And I love the common example where we're, we're talking about like teaching a young student to know their name or to read their name. And if you had some really good discriminative control, they would see their name out of an array of three and they would be able to choose their name. Uh, quickly. Um, But if you have restricted distributive control, and then maybe that's restricted right to the initial letter only, they could choose their name out of, like, their name was Sam, they could choose the name Sam out of Bob and Gary. But if they had Sam, Sue, and Sandy, it may Mm -hmm. be more difficult there because of that restricted discriminative stimulus. So that's what we're kind of looking at here is this overselectivity and this restricted stimulus control. Right. So Responding is controlled just by that first letter, the S. Right. And you don't look past the S, right? You're just looking at the S. Okay. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. You know what I think of? What? I like to relate a lot of things to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, yeah. Which right. which, which version? Johnny Depp um, or... No. The old version. Of course, yeah. The Gene Wilder version. Come on. He's handsome. He does such a good job mm-hmm. in that role. He does. But the part where Violet Beauregard gets the stick of gum... And he's trying to explain to her that it's special gum, right? And she's like, buy gum, it's gum. And he says, no, you don't understand. He says, and she says, so long as it's gum, and that's for me. Because it doesn't matter what else there is about the gum that maybe she should know. Like, it's gum that makes you turn into a giant blueberry. That part is yeah. irrelevant to her. She's super focused on it just being gum. So for her, it's like, no matter what else is going True. on there. The reinforcing word is gum, and she's not attending to any other aspect of that conversation. Hmm. Yeah. Even though it's like a four-course meal, I believe. I think she has a turkey Roast dinner. Roast beef and a baked potato. Oh, yeah. Here comes the pie! <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I think this study, if you get a chance to read it, everyone should. It's like very elegant. I like, that is exactly the word I wanted to use. Yeah, it is. It's so thoughtfully done. When I, when we will really get into the procedures, but they really thought of everything. Yeah. Um, and I was reading it, and I was like, that is really interesting. And wow, they did not miss anything in this article. Like, they thought of everything. 
I appreciated the pictures because there were yeah. a lot of like D O R, you know, a lot of acronyms that I had a hard time like remembering because uh-huh. I read this and then kind of left it and then came back to it. And then I was like, oh no, the pictures. Oh, it's that one where they mm-hmm. where they point to the those or they point to those shapes and these other shapes. And then they appear again or they don't appear again. And then it sort of all all kind of clicked. So yeah, there you are do, pictures. You need the pictures yeah. for this article. So as people are listening to this, it would be probably good to review the pictures. Right. And go with it. So what they've been looking at pre- in previous studies in this lab is they were looking at delayed matching to sample tasks with multiple sample stimuli, so compound stimuli. So on each trial, the two samples would be presented and the comparisons would be presented. So it would mm-hmm. kind of be like the word dog and the picture dog. That would be an example of a compound stimuli. So if I showed a picture of a dog and I said, dog, there's two stimuli there. There's the word dog and then the picture of the dog. So that's an example of a yep. compound stimulus. And then they put the par- the comparisons out once the participant touches the samples. So the picture of the dog would be on the screen. They would say dog, picture of the dog. They would touch the picture of the dog. The samples would disappear, and then the comparisons would come up. Um, so that's what it would look like. So they were looking at this, and they realized that on a lot of times in this two-sample delayed match the sample procedure, one of the stimuli within the compound stimulus would control responding, but not necessarily the other one. And so when they were looking at this, they found out that they could tell based on how well the student did what was controlling responding. So if they had above 90% correct, they said that, okay, yeah, there's no overselectivity going on. If they had below 33%, nothing was happening, which I love. But it was this right. intermediate score, around 67%, that would demonstrate overselectivity because in some instances the participant would get it right because mm-hmm. it would be that sample that's part of that compound. Or mm-hmm. There would be that comparison that's part of the sample. Right, stimuli. they're performing above chance. Right, but because they're getting it right sometimes on that one comparison, that one sample, part of the sample that's controlling responding but not the other mm-hmm. sample. So they wanted to kind of look and see if they could figure out how to work on that. Previous research had used naming as a differential observing response, so if they see the stimuli, they would have to then name the different parts of the stimuli, and that was effective. But naming obviously isn't effective for nonverbal learners, so they Mm -hmm. wanted to develop a procedure to examine whether they could have a generalized nonverbal differential observing response that could then help facilitate learning of these compound stimuli. So that's why they did it, which is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Because we have a lot of students where I work that don't talk and can't name, Mm -hmm. which would be difficult. If you're like, name this, and they can't. This procedure's a failure. I don't know what I've done wrong. Yeah. (laughs) The basic research was there. (laughs) So they had three participants, all diagnosed with an intellectual disability. They had, you know, they had snack food preferences. They could exchange their plastic uh, poker chip tokens for food. They could do some match to sample to skills already, and if they couldn't, they taught them. So that wasn't necessarily part of the experiment. I appreciated that, though. I did, too. That they didn't just automatically exclude anyone who couldn't already right. do the matching task. They actually taught them before the study even started. They were like, oh, you're excluded. See you later. Yeah. yeah. No, they're like, oh, no problem. We'll just teach that first. Yeah. I appreciated that. So that was pretty nice. So they did a lot of pre-assessments first, which I actually really appreciated. They I think sure did. <laughs> they really, they went to town. It was like a whole <laughs> other experiment in the pre-assessment. So the first pre-assessment they did was a one-sample simultaneous matching to sample. So they had a sample stimulus appear on the screen. The sample stimulus would be in the center, and it would stay there throughout the entire trial. And these were all little picture, yeah. pictorial. Pictorial. Samples. So yep. you viewers at home, listeners at home can't see the tables here, but they're all like arbitrary little, they're like wingdings type of things. So they look like, <laughs> I see one that looks like a top, one that looks like a nose, one that looks like an alien spaceship, one that looks like an hourglass. A squash. Oh yeah, like a maybe squash. a squash. Yeah. Yeah, they're just little a like outline shapes. Chess. Right. And yeah. they, they did talk about in the discussion why they use these arbitra- uh, arbitrary stimuli, because they wanted to make sure that there was no reinforcement history 
correlated with the stimuli that they were using. So if they yeah. used, if they did a clinical application, they wanted to make sure that they weren't using stimuli that had been previously used in the classroom. So they're pretty odd shapes, let's say. Let's say they do. So the first assessment they did was a one sample simultaneous match to sample task where one, let's say the squash, squash right. is, appears in the center of the screen. It's like, da-da. And then along the corners, three of the corners, there's other comparison stimuli, one of which looks like the squash. So the squash is there, the three comparisons show up, and then the participant needs to just touch the identical comparison. And then I've seen this play out, and they get a token to put in their little bank for the end, and then the screen goes, la-la, and it like has like <laughs> a little like firework. Oh, nice. Um, to go to the next trial. We have an inter- inner trial interval, but before if they get the correct response, there's like a <laughs> type thing on the screen, which is pretty fun. So everyone rocked that. The highest number of trials was Ellen, and she had five trials, but everyone else was at their three, which was their criteria, mm-hmm. to move to the next assessment. And their next assessment was a one-sample delayed matching to sample task, and that was very similar to the simultaneous task, except that the stimuli, the sample stimuli appeared, disappeared, and then the comparison stimuli appeared. So the sample stimuli was no longer present. Everyone again rocked that one. It was very quick. Everyone's awesome. like, got this. Mm-hmm. They moved on to then the two sample stimulus. So this is more of that compound where you had two um, stimuli present. And again, pretty similar. You have the two stimuli present in the center, comparisons on the corners, Everything's on the screen at the same time. What's interesting to note here, I think it's important to put, is that there was one correct comparison that had both, that was identical to the two sample, but then the other two had one of the samples and one incorrect. So they could see here if they were just looking at one of the samples or the other one. And when it was simultaneous, everybody also rocked it. So when they could see the sample, they presented with the comparisons, the sample was still present. Everyone got 94 or above across very little trials. I love that Ellen only had one, and they were like, due to yeah. error. Oops. <laughs> I know, that I put a frowny face. Yeah, but that happens. She it still rocked happen. it. Yeah. So that's fine. And then here where is where you see your kind of breakdown where you see stimulus over selectivity where you have see two sample delayed matching to sample so again you see the two sample the two stimuli sample in the center of the screen you can look at it goes away and then the comparisons pop out and you have to choose the comparison that is is only one it's only one sample right, right. in the comparison only one stimuli in the comparison right so you're shown two they you go choose away one. And then only one of the two that was initially present appears in the three choice boxes. And right. So you have to remember two different symbols right. and then determine which of the two that were pre- present before right. are currently present yeah. and pick the right one. And so there, everyone ranged around 66% to 71%, which would demonstrate over-selectivity because they're getting some of them right and then some of them wrong. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty fun. And then those were all of their... Oh, and then they did a uh, compound simultaneous matching to sample where they had the compound stimuli and then they had to choose the compound comparison. Right. So basically but, everyone, if it's simultaneously presented, everyone can figure it out. Yeah. Whether it's matching one, matching one of a set of two, or matching the whole set of two. They mm-hmm. can do all of that. It's only when two are presented and removed and then you have to remember one of the two that people get tripped up. Mm. Right. Because perhaps when the initial SD is presented, they're just honed in on one One. pair. Right. And then if that one's not present in the comparisons, they can't, you know. Yeah. Right. They weren't paying attention, so (laughs) they can't get it right. Oh, guys, just pay attention. It's a tough one. (laughs) It is a tough one. But they're all these, like, random symbols. But the good thing is, is that's why they're doing the experiment. Yes. So... (laughs) Good thing everyone didn't get it, right? Yeah. And they have a plan. Now they have a plan. So they wanted to look at, evaluate the effects of the differentiating of observing response on two sample delay match to sample. So they first did the initial baseline condition where they just looked at delayed match to sample accuracy just generally. And they did 36 trials across 
sessions. And then they moved to the compound DOR. So the compound DRO was a procedure that had the compound simultaneous matching trial within the sample observation period and then followed by the actual two sample delayed match to sample. Yeah. The nice thing is, is they taught, well, they looked at this during pre-assessments. They provided reinforcement during pre-assessment, but during the experimental condition, if the participant got the answer right or wrong, it didn't matter. No corrective feedback was delivered Mm -hmm. in that observing response. So they could get it wrong and still move on. So that's really all they did. And they called that the compound simultaneous matching when it when we produce differential reinforcement, yep. but they call it the observing response, the differential observing response, when it did not produce mm-hmm. reinforcement. So yeah, so they gave the compound stimuli, and then the compound stimuli stayed on the screen. Then there was three compound comparisons. There's the differential observing response. Then once the participant selected one of the comparisons, the two stimuli sample appeared on the screen again, then it disappeared, and then you had the single comparisons at the end. So that was the experimental condition. And I just think that's really fun that they embedded something that they assessed in the pre-assessment into their experimental condition. So the participants had a previous learning history with that, but they weren't receiving direct reinforcement. Right. Um, and then they said they like scattered a few six. trials of the compound simultaneous matching in there so that they right mm. reinforcement was continued on some s- schedule they had six for responding they had six compound simultaneous matching trials within the 36 trials so at least they had some intermittent reinforcement and what's really nice is that i think it was fairly effective you know so we see all the participants along the panels and they have their accuracy scores and overall people are you know, performing fairly low in the two sample delayed match to sample in the beginning. Uh, scores don't go really above 80% with the exception of Ellen, who has some increased accuracy yeah. scores during baseline. But then once we see the compound DOR, we do see an elevation in responding in the compound DOR. And for m- the most part, we do see an increase in responding as well in the two sample delayed match to sample. Which would make sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty, I think it was pretty interesting for all the participants. And then when they removed the compound DRO, however, they did see a slight decrease in responding for all the participants, demonstrating that the compound DOR did not have lasting effects mm-hmm. nope. if it wasn't in place, which is sad. So one for one deal. <laughs> right, you right? gotta it do it. It only works for that particular right. trial. Yep. But it does work. But it does work. It definitely worked, but it just didn't show a lot. It didn't show lasting effects in the absence of treatment. Right. So what I was wondering, too, is when they added in the differential observing response, the participants had a longer period of time to sort of engage with Mm -hmm. that stimulus pair. Mm -hmm. So maybe just by having it present for a greater length of time, there was an increased opportunity to look at both pieces of the stimulus. Sure. And I don't know if that was really accounted for. Like, what if they had a condition where they just kept the stimulus on the screen Mm -hmm. for a longer period of time? Mm -hmm. Or required them just to touch the stimulus without making a a match? They have done that in previous studies in 19... Constantine and Sidman in 1971. See, I knew you'd know. Yeah, I do know that one. (laughs) Um, So that does work. Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't work when it's compound. Because you may still be overselective to one component. Okay. Yeah. So they do say that they did see overselectivity greatly reduced, but they said that the mere exposure to the procedure was not sufficient to eliminate overselectivity when observing responses were no longer prompted. So if they prompted it, great. But if it wasn't there, it didn't work. So they said that we have to figure out ways to teach students to observe multiple stimuli when there is no requirement to then display some type of differential observing response. Mm -hmm. Or maybe just to always teach them to engage in a differential observing response. But that may not be doable. I think, yeah, it would certainly depend on the the task. And they they give some examples in the discussion. This is what it could look like. They actually mention one of the the strategies that's in in the second article we'll be talking about. And 
I suppose you'd have to look at the application, which is not really the, the focus of the right. study. Another limitation, or they said one possibility, was because of the way reinforcement was delivered. So following a correct response, you got a token, but then you exchange their tokens on a token board for a variety of things in a store or like a token prize chest at the end. So there may have been some discrepancy between the number of tokens you receive contingent on correct responses Mm -hmm. versus like what you got. So they said like one was like 36 tokens. So there was like 29 tokens. Right, who knows? Who knows if that was like a difference or if they noticed like, oh, now you get a little extra of that Twix bar because if you didn't have enough to buy the whole Twix bar, you could buy like a portion of the Twix bar with your leftover tokens. So maybe that was... A possibility. So looking at reinforcement variables when doing this type of study. That would be a whole other study in and of itself. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it would, you know, be different for each participant, one Mm -hmm. would think. I'd pay a lot of money for a Twix bar. (laughs) There you go. I liked that, like, where you put all the tokens on the price tag. That was it, right? It was just a treat. I liked that idea. And I pictured those, like, giant price tags, like you wear on the prices, right? (laughs) Yeah. That, like, taped down. And it's, like, big. It had spots for all the tokens. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think I think it's definitely, this is a needed area of research, especially for nonverbal learners that are having trouble differentially observing that sample. And one of our friends actually did a, an extension study looking at the clinical application, and it was Barbara Doobie and Dixon published this year, 2016, in Java. It is hot off the press. Yeah. So yeah. shout out. Way to go, Rachel. Good work, Rachel. And Chada. And Chada. (laughs) So if you wanted to delve further into the clinical application of this bridge study, Mm -hmm. that would be a good article to check out. Yeah. So it takes it just one little step further, and then instead of using these arbitrary symbols, they used actual pictorial representations. So they were two random pictures paired together. Like they, They have some nice graphic displays in their study, too. There's like a telephone and a barnyard. And a peacock, and an ear of corn, and a laundry basket, and a kite. These were all the compound stimuli. Mm-hmm. So they continued to be random things, and perhaps, you know, not that familiar to the learners, but they were pictures rather than just arbitrary. Dan, a sneak, sneak preview. I didn't get a chance to, to, to read that article in prepping for today. Similar results, different results. I know, because I was just luckily, you know, looking around to make sure that I knew enough about stimulus over selectivity, and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> Rachel! You're just throwing these articles at us, you know, <laughs> sitting down to record, and just hucking them. This is perfect. So, you know, they had five different participants, and the setup was largely similar to what Doobie McIlvain had looked at, with a, a few modifications that we maybe don't have time to go into too much today, but overall they found some pretty similar results and that they were doing an initial pretest, and then they did some tabletop training. They prompted scanning between the different items to ensure the differential observing response was occurring, and then they, looked, they were looking for generalized matching, and they found that across participants, which is pretty exciting to see. Mm-hmm. Do they have a similar result in which, without the treatment, the, the results, this, this uh, learning did not carry over the same way? Nope. They went back and did a post-test, and responding maintained. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. so it, it increased and, and maintained following training. Oh, well, perhaps it was the fact it was real. Yeah, maybe. Real-world pictures. So there could have been some sort of learning, some sort of learning history. I'm sure they controlled for it similarly to, to Doobie and Micklevane, but it, it's, it, it's sort of like the difference between when you're doing a real task with with a student, and they got it, no problem, and then you give them you know, a standardized assessment, and they can't do it at all because it's just ar- it's arbitrary, there's no... There's, there's no queuing whatsoever. Yeah, it's like there's just nothing to like catch on to. Mm-hmm. I feel like I would have a hard time if it were like Latin words or wingdings or just random symbols. Right. Mm-hmm. Remembering them too. Yeah, there's no because there's no there's no context. I mean, you might make the little stories we did like, oh, it's a squash and a and a pawn from chess. So I mean, we might be able to kind of mm-hmm. right. make up a little story to help us remember things. But or you think something looks like something that you hate. You mm-hmm. never know, you know, like with, with wingdings. I was in a, one of those studies. Oh, yeah? Where arbitrary stimuli studies, and it was looking at heart rate mm-hmm. to um, violent images on a computer screen. So I was, like, hooked up to a heart rate monitor. And so they had these pretty violent images of, like, earthquakes and, like, murder scenes. And they would flash them in front of the screen. And then in between each of them, they had just a black screen with a white 
cross, like a white, it was supposed to be a T. Mm. And that actually gave me more anxiety. <laughs> they had to quit the session because I'd watch these videos and something probably would happen. But then I would watch the like inner trial interval and I would start sweating and get real nervous. <laughs> My hands got so I was like, I'm going to pass out. Because they were like, oh no, that's supposed to just be the control. And I was like, no, it's so weird. What are you doing? <laughs> because it had some previous history associated with it, I guess, but... Hidden trauma. Yeah, I guess. Some hidden some hidden childhood trauma. Oh, I, um, was, I always think of those video games where you're playing like an Indiana Jones character, and they're like, oh, I'm in this ancient Aztec tomb, and these symbols, I have to match the symbols. And I, for the life of me, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's like an eye with the thing. I'll remember that. And then and you, you go never and you do. turn the little wheel to make and to open up the gate, and it's like, wow, what? I can't remember. Which, is this the eye with mm-hmm. the thing? I don't know what it is. And yeah, I hate it doesn't those necessarily matter. Yeah, because they mean, they mean not nothing. It's just not remember. functionally appropriate for you to remember it. So I wonder. I'll send. I'll send a letter to that game developer and say, "Here's a here's a procedure you should be using. Your game players will appreciate it." Can you put in a a differential observing response, please, of compound stimuli? <laughs> Done. All right. I can tell you guys a little bit more. So the, what they did here was they initially started with one sample and they worked on sorting samples hmm. into different piles, and then they sort of shaped sorting a compound stimulus into eventually matching to sample. I like that. And they added in what they called prompted scanning, which is definitely something I've recommended in the past when mm-hmm. I've had difficulty for kids in, with persistent errors, which is pa- you know using a point prompt and pausing at each comparison stimulus and making sure that the child looks at each stimulus. And so they added that, that in, and then following all of that, they taught the match to sample, and they saw that maintain over time, which is pretty cool. And maybe the difference here is that uh, that prompted scanning, maybe that was just a little bit easier to teach as a response. And You didn't have to look at the corners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that too. Maybe something about it was just a little bit easier the to continue to, oh. to do right. when the prompting mm-hmm. itself was removed. So mm-hmm. it's really cool. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So a nice Sweet. follow-up. It only took, uh, wow, it took a long time between <laughs> the original article and a... Uh, Later. There's actually a lot of research out there on stimulus and there selectivity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but this is a direct follow-up and mm-hmm. as far as it's just some of the same authors. Mm-hmm. And we just don't have enough hours in the day to go over all of the over-selectivity articles. No. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. So before we move on to our next article, I wanted to give those of you who will be applying for continuing education credits for listening to the show our first secret code word. And that secret code word is scorcher, as in, it's a real scorcher out there. Uh, we'll spell it non-Boston accent style <laughs> with an actual <laughs> E-R at the end. Will you say it for us? Scorcher. Nice. It's a scorcher out there. But I will pronounce it scorcher, scorcher, scorcher out there. Milady. How do you spell it? S-C-O-R-C-H-E. R. Got R. it. All right. <laughs> you won the spelling bee. I did it. That was surprisingly easy bee. Mm-hmm. All right. With our first code word out of the way, let's move on to our second article, increasing the saliency of behavior consequence relations for children with autism who exhibit persistent errors. And this article is much more of an application, direct application article rather than a bridge study. And I remember when we first read it, uh, I think we read it a few a few months ago. We, mm-hmm. we discussed yeah. it at, at one of our uh, local journal clubs. We really, I think everyone was really like, "Ooh, what a great idea this is!" Yeah. So, Diana, why don't you share this great idea with the world, or specifically people who want to read Java but didn't have time to read this article specifically back in 2014? Sounds good. I am really excited to talk about this article. That's why I want to talk about this topic. Was because I think this article is really cool. And so while it is a practical application, and it does have some nice meaty parts to it, it also goes into some theoretical background, so it has some juicy parts as well, and I'm going to quickly discuss those with you guys too. So the whole reason why we're talking about this is because it's common to have situations where you might have persistent errors occurring and trying to figure out why that's happening and what's the best way to remedy that can be challenging because, like I said, there, I feel like there are so many factors that can go into these types of problems. 
while our technology is set up in such a way where we should be able to break it down and figure out what's happening, that can take a long time. And sometimes it's hard to know where to start. So this article does a nice job of helping to kind of break down thinking about skill acquisition and where problems can often arise. So they talk about, or I'm sorry, it's Fisher and colleagues, they discuss three main reasons why persistent errors often occur. The first being that the SDs or the discriminative stimuli that are present may be too similar Mm -hmm. in order to be uh, well discriminated, which to me, Jackie, seems to be the issue that Doobie and McElveen are largely working to address. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. The example they give is, you know, maybe someone's being asked to touch magenta and touch pink, which are quite similar. Rob, would you know magenta versus pink, you think? I totally Like a, like a hot pink or, or like a standard pink? Well, okay. Very good. I, 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 you've discriminated maybe. two pinks, so that's good. <laughs> I can maybe do that. Yeah. Magenta's like a purpley pink. I think I could. But if you ask me to do variations of blue, oh, that yeah? may be more challenging mm-hmm. really? for me. Yeah. I like studied my Crayola box. I did not. I didn't even have a Crayola box. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I did. I had a cool one that was like a carrying case. It like flipped around mm. and it held like 128. I just I had, had the metallic ones. Whoa. Oh yeah, I had mm. them all. Come to your so house. I know a lot of colors. I liked stickers. Oh right, I remember? Remember? Oh yeah. I was more of a sticker gal. Yeah, I was all arts and crafts. I also had that Barbie fashion plate one where you colored the paper. And oh, then... I had that too. But okay. That's... Okay, good. That was not crayons. That was colored pencils. Gotcha. Sorry. Diana. I know. Okay. Errors. Anyway, that's if the discriminative stimuli seem too similar. Next up would be if the response, different responses are similar and yet are, would be reinforced differentially. So the example there is go place the ball six feet away versus seven feet away. One of them would be right, one of them would not be right, but that can be a very difficult discrimination to produce. I would fail at that one. I have no concept yeah. of space. No, I can't do space. Feet. Matt's like, Time. put that put that way over there, like maybe 100 feet. And I'm like, is that outside? Right. <laughs> is that <laughs> down the road? Yeah. The ball field? <laughs> and then I'm like, one foot, two foot, as I'm walking <laughs> with my feet. I'm that's, like that, real that's, bad. I typically have to do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's not easy. I did get a new app on my phone called Units Plus. Thank you to one of my graduate students for telling me about it. So it converts different types of measurement. So if it's like ounces to gallons. Oh, sweet. Or, yeah, because I can't do anything. Oh, uh, um, so you mean the metric system. Me. That's the trick. Can, can you can, ask Siri? No, I don't like her. But I can use this new app, cool. Units Plus. All right, fabulous. It's free. All right, and then the third potential reason why you might see persistent errors, which is also addressed within the study I'm going to be talking about, is that the reinforcement schedule might be too similar for correct responses versus incorrect responses. When you think about it, if you, let's say, have three stimuli that you're trying to teach, and maybe two of the three stimuli the the student can do correctly, but one of them they can't, and you're interspersing all three of those, then they're probably going to be receiving reinforcement on an FR2 schedule, right? And not receiving reinforcement one time out of three. So the extinction, I know we don't talk about extinction that way, but it's on like a one out of three type of schedule. Mm -hmm. So overall, a lot of reinforcement's being given, and it may not be that discriminable that it's being received for only some stimuli or some responses and not for other responses. But overall, this whole experience is pretty reinforcement rich. Right. So it can be easy for errors to continue in that type of situation because it really, there's a very good chance that while that exact response isn't being reinforced, the whole situation is operating underneath a pretty uh, heavy schedule of reinforcement. Right. Mm. I do love here that they state, you know, it's not the subject's fault, but it's the subject is always right. So it's kind Mm -hmm. of your fault that you haven't arranged the situation Mm -hmm. appropriately to preclude errors. So I love it when they say that errors are just instances of misarranged stimulus control. It's true, right? Absolutely. I think that's important to bring up that it's it's not the student that is making errors. It's you controlling the situation. Does that apply to the customer is always right phenomenon as well, do you think? I think so sometimes. Well, the customer is behaving according to their 
behavior that's been reinforced in the past. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's the fault of all the other establishments that have reinforced their behavior. Oh, so mm. don't get mad at your customer. Get mad mm-hmm. at every other place they've ever shopped yes. and mad about your return policy. Right, not... correct. Mm. Oh. Man, <laughs> they, should tell, they should tell the 16-year-old kids work in retail this this fact. I think it would take a lot of stress off there yeah. as Disillusion. someone who used to do that. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was a good point, Jackie. Thank you. Yeah. I, I wanted to make sure we mentioned that, too. Um, okay, so they broke it down into that, into those ways of thinking. And then additionally, they also said... And we can also be thinking about the antecedent behavior relation that's being established within this learning paradigm and the behavior consequence relation as well. And that there could be confusion regarding what are the correct responses in either of those two aspects, right? So there might be changes that could be made to the antecedent conditions of the learning situation that's being set up or to the consequence conditions that are being set up. So what they wanted to do in this study was address the behavior consequence relations and perhaps what they called increase the saliency of those behavior consequence relations, really speaking to potential difficulties in their reinforcement schedule, Mm -hmm. trying to make that situation much clearer to the individuals in the study as far as when they were receiving reinforcement and for what reason. Right. There were three main pieces of the treatment package that they put together in order to address the behavior consequence relation here. The first one is they had three clear containers set out, and for each correct response, an edible that had been determined by a preference assessment was placed into one of the containers. Once all three containers were filled, so three actually consecutive correct responses. FR3. Yep. All three reinforcers were delivered. So this was a a second order FR3, FR1 schedule. So every three responses, you get all of the reinforcers together, okay? However, during the course of earning those three reinforcers, if an error occurred, all of the reinforcers were removed from the cups, and you needed to start over. Mm -hmm. So you had to get three correct consecutive responses in order to receive the reinforcers. Right, and it's important to note here, too, they don't specifically say it, but they didn't do an error correction procedure, so they didn't tell the participant the correct answer when they made an error. They just removed all of the uh, reinforcers. And so that's something that they don't say specifically, Mm -hmm. but I think it's an important thing to note because they don't then embed an error correction procedure, which we would typically, Mm -hmm. I think most people would typically do in some sense, and say, no, 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 that's wrong. Like, not that way, but, you know, like, here's the right answer. They don't do that. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you for noting that. I actually hadn't thought about that. So that was the response cost piece of the whole thing. So they really wanted to assess sort of this entire package. They had three participants, all with a diagnosis of autism, who participated. Zane was five, Bard was five, and Dawn was six. And each of them had a verbal response that they were looking for as the skill that they were learning. For Zane, he was supposed to sort of give characteristics of different things, so... The question was, tell me tell me things about, and then he had several categories, like, tell me things about apples, or tell me things about zebras. And then he showed, he was supposed to list several things about each of those, and they rotated through. For Bard, his SD was, tell me some, and then it was either two categories, animals or numbers, and he needed to name some animals or numbers. And for Don, uh, for him there were visual stimuli as well, and the cue was, hand me blank and then he had like eight different colors that were present and he needed to hand over the correct color for each of them there were 12 to 18 trials per session and like i mentioned before before they started they did a preference assessment for each of them so that they had presumably potent edible reinforcers in place i'm sorry and i did what i also didn't say is that each of these participants had persistent errors with these skill acquisition tasks these are the actual skills that they had right had, yes. Had been having trouble with. They were. And they've so they tried had... other types of things first. So they tried the mm-hmm. error correction procedure. They tried differential reinforcement before. They had tried prompting. They had tried reinforcement of the correct response after they got the error. They tried repeated practice for most of these, and they saw no responding. No yes. increase in responding. Yeah. Or correct responding, right? So they saw responding because they yeah. were just getting it wrong. But it was, <laughs> it was you know, a little bit above chance, it seemed like, right. from the graphs, but not... Yeah. Not what we would consider any sort of mastery criteria. And not really rocking it, let's just say. 
These were difficult discriminations, too. Yeah. As you can imagine. So, you know, for Zane and Bard, it was a verbal response that they had to sort of pull out of the ether and present. There was no additional visual cue for them. Like, tell me something about apples. You know, he had to remember that. And a then. Field trip to the farm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then for Dawn, there were, I believe, several different stimuli out on the table. I think like eight different colors were present. So he had to look at that entire array and scan those and hand it over. So they were pretty challenging tasks. So initially, they did a baseline, which was just sort of treatment as usual, right? They reinforced correct responding on an FR1 schedule without any of the special clear containers. And responding, I'm sorry, errors were on extinction. For all three participants, responding was variable. Right again, around that 60% mark, which is sort of our benchmark there for perhaps there's some stimulus overselectivity present. Or responding is just occurring at near chance levels. Uh, They then, this was, I'm sorry, a multiple baseline design across participants. They then implemented treatment, and Zane was the first participant for that. So when treatment was implemented, we saw responding immediately well, pretty much immediately increase to high levels, around 90%. And what's also interesting to note here is that there was no additional prompting that was provided in treatment. It was just the treatment package that we talked about earlier. So the SD was presented. They were given five seconds to respond. If they got it correct, then they got that reinforcer dropped right in the little clear cup. I think that this is a really neat study because I can just visually see that little reinforcer being dropped in the clear cup Hmm. and it does seem like a really salient way to present the stimulus right and although this child can't access it at that point in time it most likely would still function as some type of reinforcer right because you'd be like see it right there and Mm. know that it's coming or it could um evoke some emotional responding potentially (laughs) yeah they don't talk about that i'd be a little worried about that yeah I see those. I've seen those clear plastic containers and assessments, and man, have I seen kids rip through those clear, <laughs> clear plastic containers in the as assessments. So that's something you'd have to be aware of, mm-hmm. is if your student has a problem with delay. Yes, mm-hmm. this might not right. be the Probably one the best. for them. I was thinking about it, and I was like, "Ooh, remember that time when I had chips in one of those clear things, and the kid just ate the whole entire bag." Oh no! Oh no! Oops! Oh, no. Um, he didn't actually chew it, but. He did take a bite into it. Yeah. Maybe not the best method, but for kids that don't have that problem, this would Mm -hmm. be pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And they also, I mean, already had been exposed to this task, so they were performing above chance. It wasn't like they just... Slightly above chance. Slightly above chance, but but, but enough so that they were going to contact reinforcement. Right. Yeah. So it's not like a novel, completely novel task. Yeah. And since they weren't providing prompting, you know, I must think that... They sometimes respond incorrectly to all of the SDs, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. But it does make this study stronger because there really is no other variable that can control responding because they don't have an error correction procedure. Mm -hmm. They don't have prompting. So they only have that the SD signals when reinforcement is going to be available, contingent on that correct response, and when reinforcer is going to be removed, contingent on error. So that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So for all three participants, when they implemented treatment, we saw a responding increase to levels where it met criteria for mastery. For Zane, they implemented treatment, and then they went back to what was their baseline, which is now their maintenance phase. So they did not keep the additional components of the treatment in place. For him, they were able to fade those out, or I'm sorry, they were able to remove those and responding maintained at high levels. For Bard and Dawn, when they, treatment initially, they put it in place and they saw responding increase. When they removed it, responding started to deteriorate uh, very clearly for Bard. And then for Dawn, responding was sort of at a variable level that wasn't quite up to what they were looking for. So for both of those individuals, they put the treatment back into place. For Bard, they needed to do that one time. And then responding did maintain in the baseline slash maintenance condition following that. For Don, they needed to do it two additional times. His responding remained somewhat variable, although it was all between 75 to 90 percent, sort of regardless of whether he was in the treatment phase or the baseline maintenance phase. It was still higher than it was initially. Right. Though. So it was interesting to see there that for some participants, they needed to sort of reintroduce that, and then eventually 
it worked a little bit better. Perhaps they just needed a longer time with mm-hmm. the procedure. Mm-hmm. I would have loved to see it if they then had another, like a follow-up and then had another response. Right. So to see if, did they learn just, they were able to discriminate this specific skill now, yeah. or was there something else that they also learned that would allow them to engage in? So they, they were great with magenta and pink now, but they got mm-hmm. blue and cyan, and they were able to do Ooh, that skill because that there was just something about the, the teaching procedure where they actually learned the, the bigger, the higher order skill rather than just those two stimuli. Right. That's one thing that they suggested, though, in, yeah. in the discussion is that it's possible now that they there was such a, a difference between the reinforcement procedure and the, when there was an error that now there was some discrimination there. So they were hoping that it would mm-hmm. keep going. Yeah. One thing, interesting thing I note is that even though we saw an increase in correct responding, uh, correct responding, the actual rate in delivery of reinforcement decreased like pretty significantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that might be interesting for some some readers. Even though they saw that initial decrease of reinforcement, correct response increases. So they weren't sure whether it was the response cost procedure or it was just seeing the reinforcers available that worked or maybe both, but they didn't really assess that. Right, yeah, they didn't kind of break that apart Mm -hmm. to figure out. Did putting the reinforcer in the cup function as a reinforcer? Or was it really just the punishment procedure that Mm -hmm. was more effective? Yeah, we don't know. Could you suss that out? I can't remember. I think you could. They didn't, but you could. So you could do a component analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. take the whole thing and then tear it, tease tease it out piece by piece. You could do it across participants or within participants or across tasks which someone i think should do because mm-hmm. i think that would be really valuable to know do all i have to do is visually display maybe i don't even have to do a response cost contingency maybe just seeing it and then not seeing that reinforcer delivered in that clear covered box would be enough of a salient cue mm-hmm. to indicate an error than just taking everything away because we do know that we're with any sort of punishment procedure there is a lot of side effects that we need to take into account so even though response cost is you know, relatively benign, and people, like, want to use it all over the place. It does. Um, it's everybody's favorite treatment. <laughs> people love it. They do. Um, people don't think of it as punishment. Right. Yeah. But it is punishment. But it meets the definition. Yeah. The behavioral right. definition. Exactly. Of punishment. And, I mean, even when you're using a response cost, you do have to understand that if you do response cost contingencies, you may see a decrease in overall responding because of the suppressive effects of punishment. You may see an increase in emotional responding. Yep. You may see an increase in maladaptive behavior. You're going to see things that you might not want to see. So it would be interesting if they did do a component analysis to see, do I actually have to embed this punishment procedure or can I just not provide a reinforcer in that clear container? So just, you'd have the, you got it right, reinforcer, you didn't get it right, nothing goes in the nothing. second one, nothing goes in the second one, you got it right, put it in there. Yeah, so I'm wondering, could you just do that right. without the response cost, mm-hmm. and would you get similar results, or do you need that? My my kind of hunch is that you probably do need that response cost contingency, unfortunately. Well, um, I'm sure it depends on each right. individual. Um, mm-hmm. Right, but... It would be interesting to have some scientific evidence. Yeah. I mean, I guess it would come down to the discriminability of the reinforcement schedule, which was the right. whole point of mm-hmm. this, is that yeah. if it's a, well, I put one in, and then nothing, and then nothing, and then I put one in, like, it, are, you, are you running like, to the exact same problem of sometimes right. you get it, sometimes, it, sometimes you get the reinforcement, sometimes it's on extinction. Then it looks more like an intermittent is it, schedule. Is it too, yeah. yeah is, it, right. is it just not, not salient enough? Yeah. So, just interesting. Hmm. But you're, I think, I mean, you're right, Jack, and, and as you mentioned it too, Diana, it's important to know, are you are you required to use a punishment component in this, you know, for this package to be to be so effective? Mm-hmm. And I just think that people will throw in response cost contingencies because they are fairly effective most of the time without actually thinking and planning for those side effects mm-hmm. and then are surprised when... You know, when you take all the tokens away. Yeah, but you shouldn't be because I sure would be sad. Oh, yeah. Or mad if I had all these, like, delicious things lined up that I was, like, planning on eating. (laughs) Right. And then I had to start over. Here's an M&M. Here's an M&M. Just kidding. Yeah. Make it even worse, like, I'll eat it. It would definitely increase my attending. (laughs) I'd be like, oh, I have to pay attention. I'm not going to lose those again. Yeah. You know? And I bet it's also... I think... You go ahead. First. I think it's also important to think about the quality of the reinforcer because if they don't... And they're mm-hmm. not motivated to work for those items. Yeah. 
I don't care if you take him away. Like, take him away. I'm just right. gonna, you know, engage in other behavior that's incompatible with that correct response. I also think it's important to note that they were using this as a, you know, like, 18th resort. Yes. And that, from what we can discern, these were responses that were at least sometimes demonstrated by the individual, so they right. weren't skills that were completely unknown to them. Because in that case, you would want to be providing some, sort some of. opportunity for them to learn. <laughs> this is just right. hoping. Wrong! Yeah. So I think when you put it in that context, it, the response cost is a little... It makes more sense mm. yeah. why they added that piece. I had a question that maybe you can answer. Why did they change the visual display for Don? Oh, yeah, I didn't talk about it. that. They so up, they right? were, for him, they had started putting them vertically, and he they put the reinforcer in the, I think, the back one first. The closest one the clo- to him. Sorry, the closest yeah. one first, and then the next one, and the next one. I, I'm wondering if he was the first participant in actuality, even though he had the longest baseline, and they right. just realized that, that it was probably hard for him to, to see mm-hmm. the how many edibles he had. Yeah, it's possible. That I'm was just, my thought. I was like looking, I'm like, you didn't. You told me that it was a limitation, but didn't tell me why, why they did it that way. I think it's a, just a limitation in that they made the change right. halfway through, and mm. so I don't know like, why they would have wanted you. to do it vertically in the first place. Hmm. And then I thought, so that's well, why I the thought that they put it in up. the back one yeah. first, because they, maybe they were worried he was going to take them. Oh, maybe mm-hmm. too. But, I mm-hmm. don't know. So one other thing that I wanted to point out is that they said a limitation of the study was that they didn't include an error correction procedure in the baseline. But that's interesting, because they didn't include an error correction procedure in the investigation or in the experimental condition. Yeah. So it seems that that's actually a strength, and not necessarily a limitation. Like another component of a package that you now don't have to... To rule out right. Well, you want you want the baseline to be fairly similar to the experimental condition, with the exception of whatever you're manipulating, right? Yeah. So, it would have been interesting if they did with an error correction procedure, without an error correction procedure, and then the experimental condition. I yeah. think, mm-hmm. but I don't think they necessarily needed the error correction since they had that past history with the error yeah. correction procedure. I, think I thought I saw that as it being a limitation because it was most likely different from their past That's history. True. Yeah, mm. you're right. I could see but that. But again, I mean, they talked about how they did so many things. Who knows where that... Right. That I might know. have been the second thing they, they, they manipulated when when, when uh, updating the their treatment package, and it had been, you know, 70 trials since they'd even used an error correction procedure. So... Yeah, who knows? It may not have been... Yeah, I don't know. So worrisome, huh? Yeah. But cool. I love this article. Yeah, I know. It's, I thought it was really neat and an interesting way to address a common and persistent problem. Yeah. I, I mean, I appreciated just the, the summary. It was, it was very thorough. I always mm-hmm. love a good article Absolutely. where not only is it, just, here's a you know, kind of a, a fun experiment, and it's simple. It would be simple manipulation. It's a problem that you probably have in your practice, and it's a simple manipulation, and it was really effective. But to have such a nice discussion about what goes into these trials you know what are the manipulations yeah. mm-hmm. you could make it's the you know the antecedent behavior uh, relations the behavior consequence relations it was it was really nice to just sort of take that very in-depth dive to to these these work trials because we do them and we're sort of like yep there's a cue and then you do a thing and then you get an m&m and that's all there is to it just make sure you give that m&m quickly and don't right. give an m&m if they do it wrong and maybe tell them no this is the right answer and that's going to get you where you need to be 99% of the time. Right. And to just take the time to mm-hmm. think about, you know what? Sometimes when it's not working, it might be that you, you, nothing is discriminable. <laughs> you, you, you've right. failed in all these, all these accounts. Even if you're doing sort of the gold standard basic trial format, you might be missing all these components. Or you've just lucked out and they've all sort of fallen into, into place for the skills you've taught. But now that you're teaching harder skills or less discriminable skills, just not as effective. And, and why? Well, another thing, too, is one thing that I'm recently discovering now is that error correction procedures vary widely across agencies Mm -hmm. and across even different, like, camps of behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. And there's a nice review that they've cited in this article by McGon and and Lerman in 2013 that kind of goes all... It goes over all of the error correction procedures that were used and how it's very idiosyncratic within studies and across participants Mm. um, and across studies. So... I mean, there's so many different ways that you can tell someone they're wrong 
there isn't like a gold standard like you have to do it this way and that's yeah. gonna help so there's like so many different ways you can do it like you can keep practicing for hours mm-hmm. you know like say no and slap them on the thigh if you're gonna do traditional like low boss training and right no one does that <laughs> no one does that anymore <laughs> but you know there's so many different ways yeah, that you or, can correct the error. Or do you then present a maintenance trial and provide the reinforcer? Right. Sometimes mm-hmm. people do that, but you don't have to. For that, like, yeah. Or don't. or do you provide differential reinforcement for independent responding right. versus prompted mm-hmm. responding, which is mm-hmm. not error correction, but that's another yeah. variation. Yeah. So it's just, I think this is a good alternative since there's so many things that people are doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. another good piece. Another nice advantage of this study that they mentioned is that they did not... I need the participants to know how to use a token system, right? Yeah. And yet they were still able to provide reinforcement only every third response. And yes, they were getting three mm-hmm. reinforcers at the at the same time. But it was still a, a way that they could sort of fade out the reinforcement a little bit without needing a token system. So I thought that was kind of nice. And then that's how they got into the conversation of are the, you know, every time you drop in the M&M or whatever it is, is that functioning as a reinforcer, which we don't really know. We didn't quite tease that out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Cool. All right. Well, let's let's kind of wrap it up, pull into our dissemination station. Oh, and who's that greeting us at the platform? Why, it's our second secret code word. Oh, hi there. Hello there, Rob. <laughs> and our second code word is turtle. Turtle. Like the, the, the animal. It's, it's most of the animal. It could be the character from Entourage. I don't know. Whatever no. you want it to be. It is delicious caramel pecan oh, the th- chocolate confections. Hmm. Mm, I love those. Which, you don't know those? Yeah, I know. You're mm-hmm. talking about them. I Which, don't. Whichever one you want it to be, it's a secret code word. It's turtle. T-U-R-T-L-E. Could be ninja turtle. Whatever. Whatever works for you. All right, well, bye, Turtle. See you later. We're going to talk more about some, ge- some general conclusions from from our research readings bye, today. Rob. <laughs> Here I go, very slowly away. Trot, 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 trot. Some real theater of the mind we've got going here. <laughs> Thank you. I saw a turtle yesterday morning, actually. Really? Yeah, with my dogs, and I was walking, and he was in the show, and I was like, don't come out of your show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did he? No. He didn't. He listened to me. That's good. And then I ran away so that my dogs didn't decide to be mean to him. That's good. You're an animal whisperer. Yeah. He heard me. He's like, hmm? Huh? That was me, like, pretending to be a turtle, putting one eye out of the shell. I have a funny Pretty turtle good. fact. Oh. Well, ninja. I thought I was thinking suddenly ninja turtles. Mm. The ninja turtles were invented or created in Massachusetts. Which is where we are. Which is where we are right now. Hmm. Did not know that. In Northampton. Wow. That was Them crazy. and basketball. Sewers. But that, aren't, that was Springfield. Yeah, Diana. Oh. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Springfield. It's all out west. I know nothing, yep. turns out, about anything. You know nothing. Okay. I think for me, of the two articles, certainly the, the behavior consequence relations was the more easily applicable. Mm-hmm. The idea of, oh, wait, if I'm As having be, a real right? hard problem. Yeah, exactly. I'm having a real hard problem with this student learning this skill could I explore the behavior consequence relations? Yeah. However, I guess the bigger question is, when would you want to look at behavior consequence relations versus look at any of the other relationships in, in your trials? Is you know, in, in thinking about this and reading this, did anything pop out to either of you as, oh, I would be looking for this kind of pattern of responding or this data to judge that I should make such such a change? Because again, with any change... I think mostly, even with uh, all the the increase in registered behavior technicians, if you're training people to run discrete trial training, you are training them very clearly. You're going to give your SD. They're going to either do the re- engage in the, resp- the correct response or not. If they do, reinforce. If they don't, something. And to retrain them to like stack up blo- stack up your, your blocks with the M and M's in it and change the delivery of reinforcers, you, you know, would take a little bit of extra time. So. When to do this, when not to do this. You know, 18 manipulations, this should be maybe the first manipulation we look at. What are your thoughts? I think it's still going to be individualized for me. So if I have a student that has some pretty significant problem behavior and cannot tolerate a delay to reinforcers, I don't think I would ex- I would use this. Right. Mm-hmm. Only because I'd want to make sure that everyone is safe. And obviously it's not going to be a reinforcer if 
they never get it. <laughs> right? So what I would do if we saw inconsistent responding across five to eight sessions is go in and observe and see, you know, where I could see a breakdown. So is the student not attending to the instruction? Mm-hmm. Or it, when the response occurs, is it taking too long? Or maybe subjectively they don't look engaged with the reinforcer or they're waiting for the response. So I think I would base it more on my direct observation than on like, here's a checklist of all the things I'm going to try first, but that's just me. What would you do? I agree. I was trying to think as you were talking about what it, what does it look like in different scenarios. And it's kind of like what you described. Like if you know a student doesn't seem to be attending to the initial SD or perhaps there's too much of a delay between the SD and then the present, presentation of the comparison. Sometimes that can be a problem. Sometimes there are competing aspects of the stimuli that get in the way of looking at the right, you know, like the right part of it. So if it's a Velcro or a laminated card, sometimes those can be really distracting. When you're doing matched sample, if you give the child the stimulus to hold and then they need to physically match, like put with Mm -hmm. the sample, then that can be difficult because they can want to do all sorts of other things with the with the sample instead right. of match it. So sometimes those things will become apparent when you go in and observe and you can make changes like that. But I really liked in the Fisher article breaking it down and thinking about are the SDs too similar? Are the responses required right. too similar? Is the reinforcement schedule unclear? And then the thinking about antecedent versus consequence aspects of the whole paradigm. And I'm definitely going to use that moving forward to think about changes that we could make because sometimes you go in and you really don't know what's going on you know maybe none of those problems seem to be present and in that case I might start to look at making modifications to the reinforcement schedule maybe first like I like I mentioned either changing the prompting that's being used or using some sort of differential reinforcement for independent responses Mm -hmm. that can be a good place to start to see what happens Mm -hmm. there I'd be curious how the, like Jackie, you mentioned the the rate of the overall rate of reinforcement dropped, even though the rate of acquisition increased, or maybe not the rate of acquisition, but the the percentage of the percentage of correct answers increased. Mm-hmm. As to whether there was, you know, you would get overall a over time a difference in reinforcers delivered, because when you're thinking certainly about edible reinforcement, you want to deliver what you need. To have the student require the response, require the response, but right. not so much that either they're satiated or it just becomes kind of harmful. Like, oh man, we went through three boxes of raisinets today. Right. Great job! You learned four colors too. Delicious that's like, raisinets. That's delicious raisinets. So you know, if you if you have a lower rate of reinforcement, but but they don't really. Well, the number the the numbers the same, right? Is the overall three, number the same? They still well, get three, but they get it on the, the FR three, mm-hmm. right? Theoretically, three can. Consi- Consecutive right. responses. So it there does... could have been correct responses that go unreinforced mm-hmm. because they were next to errors. But over time, it's over time could the that... rate of reinforcement could have prob- could be problematic. Yeah, or great, mm-hmm. right? Either one, we don't know. I'm just curious if the math would work out that you get a lot more for less less reinforced. You still you still get the acquisition, but you're having less reinforcement yes. and using less of the. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Various items. and maybe you can even thin the schedule of reinforcement out. It could be more like an FR five, FR one. Mm-hmm. Doesn't I mean the, they use an FR three arbitrarily? Yes. Yeah. So you could start with an FR one, FR one, right? And then do an FR two, FR one, FR three, FR one, and see mm-hmm. how far you could actually thin the schedule of reinforcement. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's a moot point whether it has to be this way right. or it could just be any yeah. a, a, any typical you know reinforcement thinning procedure. But yeah, I just think it'd be know. fun. Just a wheel. Wheel. <laughs> I was just thinking about another manipulation that we, or that I have done in the past. I didn't come up with. Someone else came up with it. But, and you, I'm sure you know too, Rob, is it was a slant board mm. that had holes in it. It was like a wooden slant board with holes, and in each hole was a little cup. Do you know this too, Jackie? Mm-hmm. And then the three, compare. it was for match the sample, so the three comparison stimuli were Velcroed on there and covered up the cups. And then the teacher would prepare the board and put the actual edible reinforcer under the correct comparison stimulus, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's coming back to you. 
and then the child would be given the representative sample. If they pointed to the correct comparison, then they could lift it up <laughs> and actually get the reinforcer right out of the cup. And sometimes it really, really worked. I mean, it was the same reinforcement schedule that was being presented, but something about, I don't know if it was really fun. Mm -hmm. Like there was a fun component to it, to lifting it up and getting it out. Or it was just that much more immediate or, Mm -hmm. you know, tangible for the child because they were doing it themselves. I don't know if that's been studied experimentally, but it was a cool manipulation and often produced increased acquisition. We were trying at one point to do, well, not a match sample, but with a PowerPoint where if the student picked the correct stimuli on, you know, like a touchscreen monitor, it yeah. immediately would play them, you know, movie clips or pictures of things that they really liked rather than having to wait for us to be like, hold on, let me get the YouTube app. Oh, it's mm-hmm. crashing. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 that's good. Right. You know, 20 minutes later, oh, no, I, th- I think I got it. I think I got it. Yeah. Do, do you remember what you learned? <laughs> right. And we couldn't quite get it to, to work properly because it would still have that delay. But just delivering kind of electronics, sort of embedding everything into one one set of responses. That's a cool uh, idea. It's a similar idea. Of, that's the right picture. You picked it up, and there's mm-hmm. the surprise behind it. You know whether whether it's a matter of the just the fun of looking, and there's a surprise, or the delay is just minimized. I did the response, and immediately there's a thing right there for me to eat or or interact with. I had a template for that if you need it. Do you? I did at one point. I'd have to look for it. I like to make that stuff myself though. Yeah. But I would rather also then have. It was a PowerPoint a template, so you could just. Add in your stimuli. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was hyperlinked. Yeah, I would think you could hyperlink, but I, sometimes that stuff doesn't work, depending on what computer you're using. It sort yeah. of. I feel like, fizzles. how would you randomize it? Like, every time you'd have to make it different. That, well, that becomes the issue, is where do the, where do the stimuli go? Work, you have yeah. to, at least with what you just sort of have commercially, you have to have multiple mm-hmm. templates available. So this mm-hmm. is my template where right. this is the rotation, and this is the template where okay. this is the rotation, yeah. and then yeah, you have to set it all ahead of time. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's some way to to program, maybe not PowerPoint, but to program something else to have like a randomizer function where it can find the correct that response. It seems hard. It, it, would, it, it comes, it's one of those technological things that's sort of beyond my, my ability. You know, if I, if I feel like I've spent an hour trying to figure not out something. Not your ability, beyond uh, your knowledge currently. Currently, yes. If I've spent more than like an hour or two working on such a minor problem, it sort of becomes, so oh, I need to go do something else with my time. As much fun as that stuff is to try to just figure out. Like, oh, if if I could do it, it would be so cool. Uh, Any other dissemination points you guys wanted to to hit on before we sign off? I think this is good research. I think people should replicate these articles. Mm. Yeah, This is a really important area of research to me. And I know that the, you know, some of the work done here is pretty translational because you're trying to parse out and isolate these really important variables but the end result is really applicable, and there's probably a lot more out there that should be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thanks, everyone, for listening into our episode this week. We had some some, some deep, deep research to go into that was very exciting and, and accessible. So if you have Deep not, Thoughts deep by thoughts. Rob Perry. <laughs> you guys have most of the deep thoughts. I just man the computer. <laughs> if so if you have not had a chance to read these articles in preparation, please make sure you do, because there's a lot, especially with the, the Doobie Micklebain article, that... That is visual, which is not quite easy for us to present with our elaborate wordings and phrasings. I know, you couldn't see all of our pointing and gesturing (laughs) to the different parts of the screen. I should have been like, now close your eyes, but don't close your eyes if you're driving. We're taking you on a journey. Here's what the computer screen, like blank screen, white, stimuli. But I won't do that. No, thank you. It's a meditative piece. (laughs) Just imagine lavender. And some ocean music. (laughs) So nice. Thank you. I'm going to go to sleep now. Mm -hmm. For those of you listening, thanks so much for doing so. You can find us online at ABA Inside Track everywhere. You can like us on our Facebook page, which if you listen to our preview episode, we're over 500 likes. Yay. Keep liking it. Yeah, but yeah, you can keep liking it. Make a new Facebook account, like it again. That'd be great. (laughs) Uh, we're also on Twitter, and we are also, if you noticed from our Monday posting, we actually have, or Monday posting last week, we have a YouTube channel, which is a couple videos on there right now, and we'll have at least a few more trials. We're trying to think about how we can use that space to be to be fun and interesting. So you can see our faces creepily, yes. like you're hanging out with us, but we're not interacting with you. Yes. <laughs> well, actually, for this episode, we have... I've, 
almost forgot to mention the Java article actually does link to I believe it's 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 Dutch Fisher himself right. uh, discussing this article. So we're gonna have that linked on the web page, and you know we'll try to link it through the YouTube channel. Uh, I know that sometimes Java will do that, and it's always nice. So if you haven't seen it. the visuals or you want to actually hear it from from the man himself. Uh, as well as listen to our our extra commentary. Well, you'll you'll have that have that option. Awesome. You can email us at abainsidetrack at gmail dot com. Hopefully, the PayPal situation for people interested in continuing education credits has worked out. But again, feel free to email if it still hasn't, and maybe I'll give them an, a call if I get enough an, enough people who it's, it's still not working out for. So apologies if that if that's if that's you. Thank you for listening. Jackie and Diana, thanks so very much for being here for another fun-filled episode. Thank you. You bet. And for everyone else, we will see you next week for our preview episode where we'll be talking about what to read for the next full episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye.